Lesson five, the final lesson in this unit, looks at the role of um, the incoming Soviet leader in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, and of course, the uh, decline and eventual relinquishing of power of the Soviet Union over the Eastern Bloc states. Now, who is Gorbachev? Um, he comes to power at the age of 54 in 1985, and he's a reformer. Um, he was seen amongst the Soviet leaders as a young new broom to deal with the problems in Russia and the Eastern Bloc. Um, Gorbachev does not want to destroy the Soviet Union. He's a reformer and a reformist. And what that means is that he wants to try and change the USSR and the Soviet Union so that communism works better. He, um, he was trying to like save communism rather than just reform or get rid of it. He was reform trying to reform it to help it stay alive. He saw that the USSR um, than the situation they inherited, that the USSR was economically stagnant. It was well behind the West in terms of quality of life, the consumer goods it made. Uh, the younger generation was becoming increasingly restless with the lack of opportunity, and not only that, they could also see, thanks to things like the proliferation of TV, etc., um, that there was a huge difference between the two worlds of the East and the West, between the capitalist world and the communist world. And they started to yearn to be a lot more like the Western capitalist side. Um, he was also concerned that as a result of all of this, regimes in Eastern Europe were becoming less popular, and the Soviet leadership that had propped up those countries for nearing 40 years now um, was starting to, to wear thin on its people. Okay? And he basically said, knew that he had to reform the way it was, or he was going to lose control of those states as well. Um, Gorbachev, in and in and out of itself, is willing to give in quite a lot in terms of the arm race and superpower status to achieve this. In many ways, he's willing to take a, take a step back from traditional Soviet communism in order to uh, get the reforms which he needs, which he sees as the only way to save communism as it exists currently. So um, what type of an empire did he inherit? Let's take a quick look at the USSR. Number one, he saw that the USSR was uh, very economically weak. It was spending far too much on defense, that is, keeping up with the Americans in the nuclear arms race, and which is becoming a space race, and a bunch of other things. Basically, the military spending was, was crippling the USSR economy. Not only that, since 1979, the USSR had been in an unwinnable war, their version of Vietnam, in fact, in Afghanistan, and that had evolved over whether or not a uh, Soviet-backed government was overthrown by... Um, a Islamic militant group, and the Soviets had, had interjected to try and stop the growth of Islamic extremism in Afghanistan and found themselves, believe it or not, in Afghanistan in a war that was seemingly hopeless uh, to win. And he had been in that war now by the time he takes over for six years, and that war was bleeding billions and billions of dollars from the Soviet treasury. Gorbachev is also an idealist. Um, he believes that communist rule should make life better for the people. Um, not just maintain the status quo. He was offended by the fact that goods produced in Soviet factories were poorly made. Um, he was also horrified by the fact that living standards were too poor compared to the West. He understood and fundamentally got why there was so much protest growing against Soviet rule and why Soviet citizens felt less loyal to the government than they had 15, 20 years previous. Uh, the other thing you need to know about Gorbachev, he was a massive optimist. So he's a realist, an idealist, and an optimist. He believed truly, truly that his system of reforms would give people their belief back in the Soviet system, and he'll be able to restore the faith in communism that had slipped over the last 10 years. Um, he did not whatsoever intend to dismantle communism. Rather, he intended to reform it pretty radically. In Eastern Europe, though, Gorbachev, unlike his predecessors, um, had a very different outlook. Uh, he called in March of 1985 all of the leaders of the Warsaw Pact um, countries together in Moscow and told them two things. Number one, he said, we will not intervene. In other words, he made it clear uh, that unlike Hungary, unlike Czechoslovakia, unlike Berlin, um, and unlike they had threatened to do in 1981 in Poland, the Soviets will not okay, help these countries deal with their internal problems. They should deal with them, the countries. Okay, so if Poland has problems, Poland should deal with it as they saw fit. And the second thing he said to them is that you must reform. He felt that the communist system could provide a better health care, education, transportation than it was currently providing. And he said that it was the task of the Eastern Bloc countries to renew communism to match the West's 
quality of life. And that was a task that was put upon Eastern countries. The problem with actually getting any of this done and why very little reform comes in the years after Gorbachev is that the Western, or sorry, rather the Eastern Bloc countries, such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, their leaders are old school Stalinists put in because of their ability to control the population rather than to actually reform the system. And as a result, in truth, they don't believe him. They, they, they believe that he's just posturing to, to make things sound better. In reality, he's going to come down hard. So they don't really take him for face value in what he says. Soon, as they um, will come to find out and come to watch Gorbachev in action, they'll realize that they had made a serious error of judgment. And Gorbachev was serious about everything he said, and that they too would have to reform or else they would be facing rebellion in their own country. So what did Gorbachev's reforms look like? Okay, first and foremost, he goes into reform relatively cautiously, and he does have to take his time and go a little bit one by one, one foot in front of the other, um, cautiously, because um, he's also under pressure from hardliners within his own party to not introduce these policies. His first policy that he tries or, or puts out is called glasnost, and it means openness. Um, in practice, Glasnost is this. Gorbachev will go out and visit people at work and in their homes, and he'll listen to them. Okay? He'll release political prisoners. He'll invite open debate on government policy. He'll ban works and books. Uh, rather, he won't. Banned works and books, okay? things that were censored under the Soviet regime, were no longer censored. Um, he, allow, he will allow Soviets to travel outside of the Eastern Bloc for the first time. Um, he will also allow local elections, so people will be able to vote for their municipal, their city governments, instead of uh, having only the Communist Party officials running the individual cities. His second, and perhaps um, uh, equally as important step, is what's known as perestroika, or restructuring. This will reduce the central control of industry, allowing them to set their own targets about production goods. In other words, return a sense of management back to the factories rather than following government um, law. In 1988, as part of perestroika, he'll put a law on cooperatives, which will allow private businesses to be run for the first time since the end of the new, end of the new economic policy of Lenin, which was uh, abolished by Stalin. Uh, in 1928. So for the first time since 1928, Russians and people in the Eastern Bloc would be allowed to own their own private businesses and not be forced to give or be completely regulated by the government. This allows sort of the forces of the free market to be introduced slowly into the Soviet economy. And, and for a, a, this sort of structural change, a push towards capitalism, not complete capitalism, but capitalism light, if you will, um, is meant to help uh, increase or help the Soviet economy, which is doing very, very, very poorly. Um, additionally, Gorbachev will reduce defense spending. He'll cut the size of the Russian army by half a million people in 1988. And he'll go out and become warmer friends with the United States. Okay? He'll withdraw, eventually, Soviet troops from Afghanistan in 1989. Okay, because the war was costly and unwinnable, and they'll start to give many speeches about international trust and cooper cooperation with countries such as the Americans um, it, as being the way forward for the USSR rather than uh, one of confrontation and hostility towards, um, towards uh, the other countries. As I mentioned, the effort, uh, his relations with the USA improved greatly. In 1981, Ronald Reagan became prime minister, or president of the US. And Reagan is a staunch anti-communist. He calls the communists the evil empire. Um, he pursues a policy in his first few years of extending military spending, of effectively trying to bankrupt the Soviet Union. He will spend so much on the United States military, forcing the Soviets to copy in order to match them in strength, that the um, the actual underlying reason of this policy is to drive the Soviet economy into the toilet so the system collapses. Um, he will also widely criticize Soviet control uh, over Eastern Europe. Now, ironically, Reagan will help Gorbachev in a, in a couple important ways. Number one, it becomes very obvious and clear to everyone that the Soviets can't keep up with American military spending. And this will allow Gorbachev to finally say enough's enough and push through and get the government to accept 
um, reduction in military spending cuts. Effectively, get them to eventually say that you know this is we're in a, we're in a spending spree. We can't win. Um, not to mention the fact that Reagan actually gets on well with Gorbachev, and their improved relations, particularly from 1985 to 1989, will be central in ending uh, this era of the Cold War. As the Russians felt less and less threatened by the United States, by the fact that they are effectively admitting by reducing military spending that they're losing the Cold War, and number two, that the Americans are willing to work with them and they're becoming friendly, at least Gorbachev and Reagan, there's less of a need to control Eastern Europe uh, amongst the leaders of the Soviet Union. Of course, if they're not threatened from American invasion, which they're evidently not in the late 1980s, there's less of a need to worry about keeping a buffer zone, to keep keeping Poland uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, etc., as countries between them and the United States, who by the mid-1980s is less and less likely to attack them because of their warming of relations. So what he does in Eastern Europe is he goes out and tells the leaders of Eastern Europe to listen to your people. Now he makes it very clear to them that his priority is to reform Russia, and he will not be as focused on maintaining control of Eastern Europe. As Gorbachev starts to introduce his reforms of perestroika and glasnost in Russia, the people of Eastern Europe start to demand that the same reforms happen to them. Okay? Um, to what's adding to their ability to protest for these reforms is the fact that Gorbachev will make a speech in July 1988 to the leaders of the Warsaw Pact countries where he says that I will withdraw the overwhelming majority of our troops, tanks, and aircraft from your countries. We can no longer afford to pay to protect you. And in March of 1989, he makes it clear again that the Red, Red Army would not prop up unpopular communist regimes. So in other words, he says, if you don't listen to your people, if you don't fix your countries, we will not, like we had done in the 50s and like we had done in the 60s, we will not come in and save your unpopular government. You are on your own. And this has tremendous and very quick, profound impacts on the de um, uh, uh, Sovietization, looking for a better word, or the, the fall of the Eastern Bloc, in other words, for the countries to achieve their freedom. And let's go through a few countries right now, one by one, and what happened in those particular countries. Uh, your textbook also does a, a good overview of this if you want to look at it. Okay, let's go back to Poland, who we looked at last lesson. Solidarity, as we saw, proved that a unified, largely peaceful movement which wanted to reform could succeed. And we know by, by 1989 the polls have held fair and free elections, and they had voted in a Democratic non-communist party to um, to replace the Soviet party and the communist party in Poland and therefore Poland had um, by 1989 achieved its freedom. In the same year Parliament adopted a, a democratic package in Hungary which included trade union rights, personal freedoms, less restricted press, more voting rights and an acknowledgement that the uprising of 1956 was a popular movement not a rebel or foreign insurgency and as a result all of this led to the eventual um, uh, eventual fair and free elections in which Hungary votes for a democratic future not a communist one. East Germany is particularly more interesting okay um, mass immigration through newly opened borders start to raise the hope of change. When the government in East Germany started to repress this sort of movement of East to West in 1989, um, a visit by Gorbachev inspired the people as he urged the Communist Party there to reform. Um, one of the really interesting things is whether, when the Berlin Wall, still the symbol of division, was, still, was, was up, um, Gorbachev, of course, goes to Eastern Europe, and in the conversations with the East German Chancellor, he starts talking about when are they going to open up the um, the passage to the Berlin Wall, and the Ch Chancellor says, we will eventually do it, but we'll do it at a time when we can control the movement of people, we can control the outflow. So what happens is that people hear that the uh, government is talking about potentially opening up the, East, uh, the Berlin Wall. So people from East and West are flooding to the Berlin Wall and asking the border guards, when is the wall going to open? When is the wall going to open? And one of the border guards, who had heard the, the same thing but had absolutely no instructions, just sort of murmured to the people in East Germany, well, now. And completely by accident, an official eventually de effect effectively declares an end to restrictions on travel. And because no one was willing to shoot at all of the people and start a huge um, uproar, be and because someone had said, well, we're going to tear down the wall anyway, 
people just start flooding across the Berlin Wall. Crowds gather and eventually they just start tearing down the wall. The border guards put down their guns, stand back, and the Berlin Wall comes down actually by accident more than anything else. Uh, Gorbachev, interestingly enough, was not all that keen on reunification, but after long, intense negotiations, he eventually will accept that Germany can be reunified and that Germany can enter uh, into NATO. And of course, this is no small thing to accept. Now, after the Berlin Wall would come down in 1989, Germany is still not unified, and it actually doesn't unify for an in, almost an entire other year until the 3rd of October 1990. But formally speaking, Germany had begun the process of free movement, and eventually it only became a formality that Germany would unify, which it did finally on the 3rd of October 1990. I remember both of those events very, very well. Romania is another interesting example, a country we haven't talked about a great deal. Um, Romania had one of the most hardline leaders of, of all of the communist bloc, a man named Nicolae Ceausescu, who was widely hated by the people. He, in the midst of all of this collapse of Eastern Europe, makes it very clear to the people of Romania that he intended to see off any anti-communist protesters. Um, but while he's out of the country, on vacation in fact, uh, people in his country began to protest. Um, Ceausescu orders the protesters to be fired upon, but the military refuses, and Ceausescu is forced to flee. Um, Ceausescu himself is actually captured and murdered along with his family shortly after his capture by um, democratic protesters in, in Bucharest. Um, in fact, his murder uh, of him and his wife is actually shown on national television. And I tell you what, I remember that very well. Um, the, they, in the West, they didn't show the murder, but they showed the aftermath of the murder. I think you can actually see it on YouTube. Don't look it up. Um, Free democratic elections were held in 1990, so the uh, Romanian situation actually turns quite violent, but eventually the democratic protesters far outweigh the government forces. Uh, Ceausescu himself was arrested along with his wife, who was quite the, quite the baddie, and they were both murdered uh, unceremoniously, in, I think in the basement of their palace, if I'm not mistaken, but you can, you can quote me on that. I'm trying to go from the memory of a 12-year-old here, so... Um, uh, feel free to challenge me on that. Anyways, what we see is that between 1989 and 1991, every communist or former communist Eastern European country would hold a democratic parliamentary election for the first time in years. Every one of these states would vote for the end of communism, and effectively, by 1991, Soviet control was over. Now, there are lots of external factors which led to the collapse of the Soviet control in um, in a rapid session. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev, and we'll come back to him and what has happened in the Soviet Union, this is a very, very, very important factor now, but it not, needs to be considered what other factors allowed this to happen so quickly. First of all, the war in Afghanistan. Of course, the Soviets had re eventually attempted to take control in 1979 to stop Islamic fundamentalism from spreading in Afghanistan and threatening um, Soviet states that happened to be largely Islamic. The, the Soviets were very worried that if an Islamic-led uh, group took over in a neighboring country, it would spur Islamic militancy in the Soviet Union. And as such, they were keen to crush this rebellion in Afghanistan. Um, the Afghan militia, or Mujahideen, engaged the Soviets in an guerrilla warfare campaign uh, and will demoralize their army. They're actually largely supported by the Americans and the CIA, and one of the people who's actually trained by the CIA to fight for the Mujahideen is one Osama bin Laden, who learns his techniques of terrorism and guerrilla warfare from the Americans, interestingly enough. The war itself will cost billions. Um, it will overstretch the Soviet economy and not only that, international common, com, condemnation of their tactics and their bombing in Afghanistan will lead to large pressure to withdraw. So the Afghanistan war has a large debilitating effect throughout the economic crisis of the 1980s, and it's a war that the Soviets can't afford at the wrong time. The United States will play a major role here. Ronald Reagan sought to encourage and end the Cold War. He and Gorbachev will sign treaties starting in 1985 to limit nuclear weapons and encourage people-led movements in Eastern Europe. The U.S. will be behind solidarity in, in Poland. They'll be behind the unification of Germany in doing a lot of the negotiations there. They'll be actively involved in all of the countries breaking away from the Soviet Union. Not only this, they will inc increase their military spending so much so that if the Soviets um, feel the need to play hardball again or go back to Cold War tactics, they won't be able to afford to do so. And 
Eventually, this forces the Soviets to admit that they can't keep up and that they need to end the Cold War. This meant that the Soviets basically had to find another way of securing peace. If the way to secure peace before was mutually assured destruction, and mutually assured destruction isn't the case anymore because the U.S. have just more weapons that are capable of destroying yours, then there's another way, the peaceful way of negotiation to ensure that you are not the victim of a U.S. nuclear attack. So you need to make friends with the Americans now. Now, the role of Gorbachev, and this is an important point, something that's always examined, so let's think about this uh, very logically, okay? Um, to see Gorbachev as solely responsible is too simplistic. Gorbachev will create a climate in which people can make changes for themselves. He will allow freedoms and rights in Russia first and then elsewhere. The rest is done by popular movements, who for the first time are allowed to seize and um, um, allowed the freedom within their countries to seize power for themselves. So what Gorbachev does is he creates the climate or the situation in which freedom, uh, freedom seeking popular movements can for the first time seize power because we will not intervene. The last thought for this particular unit is on the collapse of the USSR. Um, the Eastern Bloc doesn't collapse and leave the Soviet Union to be the lone communist state. The communist system will collapse in 1991. Um, gradually, the republics that made up the USSR began to break away, demanding their own independence. Okay? And there's very little that Gorbachev could do. It starts with Lithuania, it goes on to Estonia, Latvia. Soon you have breakaway movements in uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, the Ukraine, and all of these areas f seek their own national independence and break away from what was then the Soviet Union. By August of 1991, fearing that the entire Soviet Union would break up, a military coup is held. Um, Gorbachev himself is arrested. He's on vacation at this particular point in Sochi, Russia. He's arrested and he's brought back to Moscow and put under house arrest. Tanks are sent in the streets uh, to prevent people from protesting any further to break up the Soviet Union, but the protests continue. In a very interesting case, even the people of Russia are tired of the Soviet Union. And the protests that, um, uh, that are happening across Russia start to hit the capital city of Moscow. And when the military seemingly is unable to control the protest, the coup uh, to take over the government and reinstate a hardline Soviet control begins to collapse. When the coup collapses, the coup leaders return to Gorbachev and ask him to return to power to calm the situation and try one last time to save the Soviet Union. But by, the, by Christmas, December 25th, 1991, Gorbachev realizes that the Soviet Union is incapable of, of um, saving itself. An opposition party had formed under a man named Boris Yeltsin, and this opposition party was presenting to the Russian people the opportunity for a democratic future, okay? Uh, an opportunity to have fair elections, fair and free elections to see what would happen. And Gorbachev realizing that the will of the people overwhelmingly was with this new leader, Boris Yeltsin, on the 25th of December, 1991, much to the surprise of everybody sitting down to their Christmas dinner worldwide, um, Gorbachev goes on TV and he announces that he himself is resigning and that the Soviet Union and communism in Russia is effectively over. Free elections would be held in a short term, and after Gorbachev's resignation, Boris Yeltsin would um, would uh, would take over in 19, uh, 1992. He would establish the um, what's known effectively known as the Russian Federation, which is um, what happens. Excuse me, the Russian Federation, which is uh, sort of a a pre pre precursor of what, what is there today. Now, simply called the Russian Federation today, um, the Russian Federation then was just an amalgamation of the states that will become after elections um, the Russia we know today. They get rid of the Soviet flag and adopt the flag that we see today. Um, they actually compete in the 1992 Olympics, very interestingly, as the unified team, not the Russians, not the Soviets, and that's the unified states of the Soviets. Um, by 1993, they've effectively sorted out, and by the late 1990s, of course, Boris Yeltsin, both as a victim of his own poor health, he was a severe alcoholic, but um, 
also two um, external pressure groups will give over power to Vladimir Putin, and that's where we sort of end up today. Now, the picture here on the wall is the sinking ship of the USSR and all of the little states that break away in 1991, uh, floating away, Estonia, Lithuania, Belarus, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get the point. Um, and that's the end of the unit. Um, lots to remember there. So is the collapse of the Soviet Union primarily down to Mikhail Gorbachev? Yes, I would say that he creates the situation for it all to happen. However, um, it, the external factors are also very important because they put pressure on Gorbachev to act in the way that he does, something he wouldn't have done unless those external factors were there. So lots of, lots of good opportunity to argue that both sides of the question in a 10 marker. You can have fun, choose the side you agree with, but make sure you make a clinching argument in your conclusion to get 8, 9, and 10 points out of 10 in this examination. You must make a clinching, clinching argument with detailed evidence to back you up. And that must be done in the conclusion, my friends. And that's the last lesson of this unit. A long one, but a goodie.